Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Customer Service Revolution podcast with John DeJulius. In this week's episode, John speaks with Jess Pischel, customer experience consultant for the DeJulius Group and dean of the Customer Experience Executive Academy. John and Jess talk about how critical it is for companies to focus on creating a world-class internal culture, not only leadership to employees, but employee to employee, as well as department to department. In this episode, you'll learn about interdepartmental teamwork, compassion and empathy, clarifying handoffs between departments, understanding how your work impacts others, understanding your internal customer, improving communication, and what a day in the life of colleagues is all about. Now here's your host, John DeJulius. Hello, revolutionaries, and welcome to another episode of the Customer Service Revolution. This is actually episode 45, and I have none other than Jess Pischel, who is a customer experience consultant for the DeJulius Group and Dean of the Customer Experience Executive Academy. Welcome, Jess. Thanks, John. And Jess, you had something really exciting just recently happen. You just did a keynote in person in Florida, right? Was it in Florida? Yes, Miami, Florida. What was that like? Was that your first in person in uh, in a while, or, or you, you've had other consulting but not keynotes? What's going on? Yeah, it was my first keynote in a while, and it felt so great to see everyone face to face. Some people wore masks, some not not so much, but you know, it was just really refreshing to have everyone in person and network and get to know each other. And and people were just so excited to see everyone again. This was a really tight knit community. And actually one of the industries that have been really, really affected by COVID restrictions, they are in the leisure travel industry. So timeshare owners, managers, developers for hotels and they were just sharing best practices of how they got through. And a lot of it related to what we are talking about today, which is world-class internal culture and how they maintained that. So it was a really timely conference for those discussion points, as well as everyone for them, for everyone to see each other again. So it was great being in person and they did the conference set up as Ted talk style. So it was just a lot of feedback, a lot of, a lot of great speakers and a great community. That's great. And it had to be really cool just to have that, you know, live in-person energy. Uh, Was it hard to uh, remember to like wear shoes and real clothes underneath just the headshot? (laughs) Yeah, it was really weird packing for a trip and also packing in business casual wear. It's not something we're used to anymore. Everything still fit, though. I was surprised. Oh, that's good. That, that, that's a big thing coming out of you know, what they call it, the COVID-15. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So you kind of already uh, let the cat out of the bag. This week's episode, 45, is on world-class internal culture. And Jess, this has always been really hot, but you as a consultant, one of our consultants who's in it more every day working with our clients... Is it me or does it seem like the pandemic has just made this everyone's top priority right now? Just from what I'm hearing, it seems to be you're doing this with every client. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's a hot one right now. It's everyone's biggest priority. How do we make sure we have a world-class internal culture? 
how do we train our people and our managers to make sure that it's sustaining right throughout this this pandemic and how do we make people want to come back to the office and create that environment so the last i believe the last five consulting workshops that i've done have been all around internal culture and leadership i have always said every world class customer service company i've ever worked with or studied was world class internally first and it starts there and I, every great customer experience is powered by a great employee experience and what we've seen here is the this really take a, a bigger hit with the effects of the pandemic and coming out of the pandemics and so there you know the pandemic had a lot of strain and emotional stress for not only customers, but but employees. And there was the, you know more uncertainty than ever and all those things that added to it. But what I've also noticed is that coming out of the pandemic, when people were able to return to work, even if they were able to return, you know, whether, whether they needed at the office, which I think a lot of companies gave them the option and, and maybe still are of working virtually. But there's, then there's a lot of companies like doctor's office, retail, uh, salons. They need people physically there. And they had a hard time bringing people back because now people uh, got used to working from home or had an opportunity to get a job answering phones from home versus going to be a receptionist at a doctor's office or whatever that looks like. But all the ones that are complaining about that they can't get employees to come back, I really feel that that's, you know, was a seed planted before the pandemic, that if you had a really great internal culture it wouldn't be so hard to get people to come back. And there's certainly dynamics with, with daycare and, or lack of daycare and, and all that. But I just think companies that were always focused on world-class internal culture had less of an issue of getting people to return both to their jobs and, and physically to their employment. What do you think? I would agree. And I think there now is the option and flexibility of a hybrid approach. So making sure that at least we're in the office, able to collaborate, share ideas, maintain the culture, be together, you know, at least a certain percentage of the time, but always allowing that option because we've realized that we can be productive at home. But yeah, I, I think a lot of my clients are looking to to move back and transition back into, into the office. I have a couple manufacturing clients right now that like you said, you have to be in person to do those things. And so I think most, most clients are getting people back to some level. So it's, and, and also how do we maintain the culture when they aren't back a hundred percent? Maybe some bad habits have been developed throughout the pandemic. And how do we make sure that we're course correcting those bad habits and, and creating good standards so that we have the the in strong internal cultures that we're really attracting and hiring and then also retaining those individuals. Ret- retention is really important right now because of the empl- unemployment rate, right? So employee uh, retention, the- right? Right, right. Sorry. Yeah. Employee retention. And Jess, when you say some bad habits may have were created during the pandemic, the virtual when we were virtually, what, what, what give me an example of what could be a bad habit that companies, leaders didn't realize they were getting away from. Well, one is is hiding behind email, right? It's so easy to shoot off an email that may be not the best news or maybe a challenging situation or I have clients that are going back and forth via email 10 times and it's like, just pick up the phone, just have that conversation. We've almost lost the social skills a little bit throughout and we are hiding behind email. So I have a few other examples that I want to share when we get to that piece in this okay. segment today. But yeah, that's and the one I was thinking of, Jess, that you, you're probably going to get to is what I like to call that we have to find a way to replicate. And if we stay in a virtual world, even to some degree, is the Keurig conversations, the hallway collisions right. of, yeah. you know, normally I would bump into you uh, as a coworker and ask you what you're working on. And it might be something I've done that I can help you with, or you're struggling with, or or vice versa, or find out that it's Peyton's birthday coming up. And all those things was a, a bad habit that we didn't necessarily, businesses in general, didn't replicate 
in their virtual meetings because they didn't allow for any sidebar conversations uh, or things I like to call rabbit holes. I think rabbit holes is where innovation comes from, where you just kind of go down and you start thinking and brainstorming. But if your agenda is too tight in your meetings, it doesn't allow for rabbit holes. Yeah, very true. Very true. So world-class internal culture is all about creating that internal world-class experience between the team members and then those departments as well. So if you have a strong team internally, we want to make sure that you have compassion and empathy for each other, not only those that are on your team because it starts there, but expanding beyond your team. So maybe you communicate with another department primarily and it's making sure you have empathy and compassion there as well. That, that means really improving your internal communication, which we're going to get into, but that tricky handoff between sales and service, making that more clear and easy to understand. So that ultimately would be eliminating customer confusion. And then your departments will really better understand the roles and responsibilities of others. And they'll understand how their roles affect other departments or customers for the overall experience that they're providing. But we want the teams as a result of, of an internal culture workshop and assessment to understand really who are their internal customers, right? When we say the word customer, we really mean whoever depends or relies on the work that you do. So although you may not necessarily be serving the customer or the client or the end user, you are ultimately serving an internal customer. So who is that internally? And once we establish that, our internal culture will approve because sometimes our team members just aren't necessarily aware. They think, well, I'm not the customer service department or I'm not in sales. I don't ultimately serve the customer, so I'm not in customer service. But really, really they are. And that's one of the brilliant pieces about the methodology is that it applies both internally and externally. We have to be treating our team members internally just as well, if not better, than we're treating our clients or our, our customers. So that's why it's also important to develop a day in the life of your colleague so that we can show and teach our team members and, and each employee so that they can better understand their result of the work that they're doing. So to be clear, the world-class internal culture is our second commandment of our 10 commandment methodology. And the first one is, is creating a customer experience action statement. And that's kind of the immersion into having a, a obsession over the customer, right? And then this isn't as much to do with how leaders take care of employees. That's very important, but that's, that's actually our world-class leadership commandment, which is 10th. This is internally how team members take care of each other, how they're trained to take care of each other, as you said, in, in, inside their own department and department to department. And I don't care what business you're in, there's a portion of employees that feel like redheaded stepchild. If you have a sales team, people that support the sales team uh, don't feel like they get the recognition. If you have consultants, accountants, lawyers, all the support staff and back office people feel they don't get the same recognition and are put on the pedestal as the customer facing, client facing employees. We're even working with police departments now. And as you know, Jess, because your husband's an officer, you know, they they call their two types of employees sworn and non-sworn. Sworn as officers and non-sworn as, you know, all the support staff. And, you know, going through that, they all feel like the officers, you know, it's all about the officers and we don't get our enough credit for the, the support we do. So this is really important. And, and I can't tell you early on in my consulting career, when we'd start working with clients and we were rolling out these great systems, client systems that we were going to, you know, that they were going to do and, and, and they were great. And then all of a sudden the CEO or, or the C-level would say, stop, stop. These will never work because internally, we have, uh, you know, so much infighting. People don't get along. They make each other's jobs harder because they, they, they don't understand each other's job. And that's why we made this number two, because we really realize that if it doesn't work on the inside, it'll never work on the outside. Yeah. So I, I was reading the other day, it was a study done by MBA students from Duke, and it had all evidence pertaining to corporate culture. And the study represented 1,900 CEOs and CFOs, 
And these were in-depth interviews conducted from the top 20% of the U.S. market share. So large companies. And it comes back to what you just said, John. They said 90% said culture is important to their firms. Well, I'm seriously concerned about the other 10% of organizations here. But they also said that 92% said improving their culture would improve the value of their company. And only 15% said culture is exactly where it should be. So I want to ask you just why why do you think that is, right? Why is 15% say it's where it should be, but 92% say improving would improve the value of the company? And I think it's just because companies know that it's important, but don't necessarily have time or energy to invest in improving their culture. And that's why this workshop and um, world-class internal culture commandment number two is just so important. And we create a day in the life video. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment, but it's, it comes back to just making sure your colleagues understand what the day in the life is. So, uh, you know, Jess, we, we, we uh, had a podcast a few weeks ago on creating a day in the life of a customer video and the power of that. Is that what you're talking about here or or, or different? It is. It's, It's pretty similar. It's just making sure that we really explain what that day in the life of your coworker looks like. So what would your team members do differently if they really knew what a day in the life of their coworker looked like? So what do your colleagues have to go through in order to complete that report on time? So maybe they have to move around or adjust their calendar. Did they have to log in late that night after the kids' soccer practice and dance lessons and bedtime routine in order to complete it because they were waiting on data or metrics from another department? How often does that happen, right? And are we realizing that that happens? So now it becomes that all-nighter race to the finish line in order to complete before the client meeting that next morning. So what is your colleague's day in the life? When we know and understand what our team members go through, we're more willing to advocate for them and then to go above and beyond. So we become more appreciative of each other's roles and departments, but we're also more willing to lend a hand to support each other. So we, sh- we strongly believe that businesses that create this day in the life video for their customer and for their internal employee have the biggest increase in employee service aptitude and empathy for their clients. So it's really just a great reminder and a great tool that companies can use and share with their team on an ongoing basis. So Jess, when you're doing this with a a, a consulting client, this could be a totally separate day in the life of video, different from the one that the external one, Um, this could be just on employees, or I believe uh, you've helped companies create kind of a, a combo video that encompasses both clients and employees in the same video. Isn't that true? You could ha- you could have two separate ones, or you could have a combo. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It depends on the company's investment and how many videos they want, and and really we we let them decide. We share a couple best practice examples, and then let them decide. But each each video, as you heard in our previous podcast recording, that each of those can look a little bit different, and they should fit the flavor of that organization organization. But one thing that is consistent is that once we develop this tool, you should use it frequently and often, right? You should start your monthly or quarterly meetings that way. And the great thing about this is you're always going to see something a little bit different in the video. Every time you watch it, something's going to resonate with you more than it did the previous time. So it's a constant reminder for employees to have empathy and compassion and brings up great talking points that you can have with your team members. So you never know what someone's going through personally or professionally, the highs and lows of their day. And we're all unaware of not only the bad things that happen, but also the positive in our coworkers' day. So at the end of the day, it's a great way to connect and making sure that you identify what those internal customers are. So what are their wants and their needs? What challenges do they go through? What's their goal? And then now that we've assessed those areas, how are we going to communicate with them? What's their call to action? So we want to develop those characters that we will, that will be portrayed in the video. And then that'll ultimately allow you to storyboard your video and make sure that you're highlighting those highs and lows and those challenges and those issues that, that come up throughout the day for the coworker and the colleagues that you understand what they're going through. And, and, and I think that's so important, right? Because this day in the life of an employee, coworker, team member is, is vital, not only to 
better appreciate that, you know, Jess may have a, you know, a nine month old at home and not getting a lot of sleep or a coworker might be having to work a second job as a single parent. And this is important, the stresses of their job. So if, if we're not in the same department, obviously, if we work in the same department, we, we, we know the stresses, but we may not know what sales needs to do their job. We want to know, you know, why they aren't closing enough sales, but, you know, they aren't getting some information back from us that they could put in on the proposal or our support team. And, you know, that's really uh, their challenges, what what their bonuses get predicated on, um, what their clients are asking of them that we never realized because we never did their job. So that also, uh, you know, makes it aware. And something that's really cool and, and timely, just you literally within, I think, the last seven days, just completed a day in the life of an employee for, for one of your clients. Tell us about that. Tell us what it looked like. I saw the video. It was awesome. Um, but but tell, uh, tell our listeners about it. Yeah, it just, it painted the picture vividly of what some internal departments are, are dealing with and addressed some issues or concerns that, that we found. Uh, so for, for example, we don't understand what the maintenance department goes through, right? It's just not something we think about because I'm not in a maintenance role. So I'm complaining about, you know, snow in the parking lot or different issues. But what I don't realize is that maintenance has to come in on on the weekends and um, come in late or uh, come in early or stay late. And so it just paints that picture so that other employees and other colleagues and other team members understand that oh, okay, that's what they have to go through. I have more appreciation for that department now. So it called out a few of those hot buttons that just needed to be addressed. And, and it did it in such a nice way that everyone was is able to, to look at that video and have greater empathy and compassion for their team members. And that's just one example, but it was really important to that organization to call that out. Let, let's uh, let's uh, shout out to them because it's it's a, a great client of the Julius Group, a great client of yours that you've been working with for several years. Bush Funeral Homes, which uh, has how many locations? Uh, is it five or six locations in the greater Cleveland area? Yeah, and the the, the interesting thing about this is, uh, you know, funeral homes they have empathy fatigue, or they they could suffer from empathy fatigue because right every customer they're dealing with has lost someone. And that's hard to, you know, when you're dealing with it, hopefully you or I, who don't work in that industry, when we hear that someone we know lost a relative or something, it's like, oh my God, like, and we feel so bad. Well, you know, if they deal with 10 customers a day calling in or, or, or whatever it is, making arrangements or all 10 lost someone. And, and so, you know, it, it's really important to recharge themselves for the customer and have that compassion and empathy. But also I could see where as a coworker, you know, having empathy fatigue for my coworker because it's like, really, you're complaining that, that Peyton kept you up all night last night when we're dealing with someone who is burying their husband of 50 years. And, and those, you know, are, are, are dangerous things you don't want. You have to be able to recharge yourself so you can give empathy because it's deserved to your coworkers as well as your customers. Yeah, so true. And the president of Bush Funeral Homes Crematory Services, Jim Bush, even said, that they are through brick walls for the families that they serve in one of the most critical points in their lives. But sometimes our team members leave the bricks on the ground they, we, they, they, to jump over, right? So we're, we're running through brick walls for our clients, but we're not cleaning up the pieces for our team members. And we're not perhaps always serving our team members the same way we would ultimately serve our clients and our, our families. So that, that was why world-class internal culture right now is so hot for them, especially in the pandemic. I hate to keep bringing up the pandemic, but in the midst of the pandemic, they've, of course, been very busy. And it's important for them to take care of each other internally and have empathy and compassion for the team members in such a critical, busy time, and especially in such an important time in someone's life as well. Well, you know, I like to say... A recession, something going on with the economy is always the best advertisement for customer experience because companies realize that the businesses that have great customer experience are affected least. 
but it's also the same for internal employee morale and internal uh, world-class culture that whenever there's really low unemployment, companies all of a sudden it's the best advertisement like, oh, you know, we need to have, you know, we're having high turnover right now. People don't need the job that they want. So they have options. And all of a sudden they start investing in employee morale. And, and this it can't be something that you just, you know, choose to invest in on occasion. It should be something that's always, always an investment. So I know, Jess, the next thing you usually do after create, helping them create a day in the life of their team members is uh, the, the nevers and always. Tell us about that because me and you had a podcast that was a, a couple of weeks ago on on nevers and always for the customers and creating those and how effective that is. How is that similar or different than for the never and always for coworkers? So if you've done your nevers and always and you have rolled those out to your team members, those are really great standards that everyone can get behind and they're easy to follow and they're simple, which is great. Some of them apply to both the internal customer and the external customer. And some maybe were created in the mind of just for external customer communication, perhaps. So we recommend that you take a look at your current numbers and always list if you've already created those and look and see which of those apply to the internal customer because the scenarios may look a little bit different. So never point, always show. Let's use that one for an example because it's pretty easy and applies to every business. Never point is, for instance, where's the restroom? Oh, it's you point with your finger, it's down the hall and to the left versus you taking your client there and showing them the way. But what does that look like internally? And for instance, maybe I ask my team member, hey, where's, can you send me that, that report? And she says, it's in Dropbox. Okay. I know it's in Dropbox. You know, it's in Dropbox. Can you please just send it to me? Like I'm, I'm asking you for a reason. I either can't find it or I'm on site with a client and I'm busy, but I'm not, I'm not asking to, you know, for something that I know where it exists. Right. So are we internally pointing versus showing each other? So that's just one example, but taking a look at any of those nevers and always that we currently have and recreating scenarios for what that looks like internally and what happens when those nevers and always occur. And then if you take it a step further and look at what ones are missing, do, are there any that should be specific to internal team members and internal communication. So what are, what nevers and always need to be added to that list or is it a separate list that's called your do's and don'ts so you avoid confusion and it's your internal do's and don'ts, uh, whatever the case may be, but just taking a look and following that same methodology to see what, what applies internally because we know how important that is. You know, and it's so true, these nevers and always for our clients, if you look at them and say, do we apply these towards each other? Uh, a lot of times the answer is no. And they really should be like, you know, ours never say no, right? Always focus on what you can do. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of no's going around internally, you know, and it could be, can I get the week before the customer service revolution off for a vacation, right? <laughs> that would be we a no, there. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, but, you know, just say no, and imply no stupid versus, you know, oh, Je maybe Jess is a new employee or, or whoever, but you're saying, oh, we have a blackout period because it's all hands on deck, but the week prior or the week after and, and not just coming up with a no, right? And so I, I think you, know, you bring up such a good point of, are we practicing what we preach? And if we're not, how, how could we ever expect our employees to go out and do the same to their clients if they're not receiving yeah. it in well, it's, it's actually even a step beyond that too, John, is creating the culture where I would never want to ask off the week before the revolution because one, it's a great event. It's, the, it's our Super Bowl. But two, I would never want to push my work off on someone else at the organization to prep for this event. So it's like creating that internal culture that, that those issues or those questions or those, those nevers start to not even come up internally anymore. And that's the arena that you want to live in. That's that's where we want to be with our, our culture eventually. And that's why we're working towards putting the time and effort and energy into creating that culture. Once a year, like-minded professionals get together to dig deeper into customer service. 
an immersive event that brings the world's customer experience thought leaders to the stage, and you're invited. The Customer Service Revolution Conference takes place October 5th and 6th in Cleveland, Ohio. In-person and virtual tickets are now on sale at CustomerServiceRevolution.com. Everything goes back to communication. And, and, yeah. and I hear that every company, we have poor communication. And, and that and I know we're guilty of this too. We'll be at a leadership meeting and we'll decide all these things, but we forget to tell everyone. And a week or a month later, we're like, you know, what? You know, you're not supposed to do that since when? Oh, we decided that six weeks ago. Well, you didn't tell. And that might be a silly example, but it, it, I feel it happens all the time that I'm guilty of uh, because it, it made perfect sense in the room, but we, we are not finding a, a good way to communicate this. But, but I mean, communication is, it sounds so simple and it's probably the biggest obstacle or, or reason for frustration internally. Right. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. When we come on site in a consulting engagement or consulting partnership, we start with discovery and where we interview a, a bunch of team members and just try to determine what the areas of opportunity are, the strengths, the weaknesses of the organization. And we try to connect the dots there as far as where our methodology will improve uh, what they need most. And we find that I ask, you know, what's one thing that could be better at your organization or what can make this the best place you've ever worked? And I would say 95% of the time, every single person in every business says one word and that's communication. You guessed it. So it is a big word, but we typically find that that's the number one issue that it comes down to. Maybe we just assume that because people have been here a while, they know how to grammatically structure an email. And that's unfortunately not always the case. So there's a few internal communication best practices that we like to implement and workshop with our consulting clients. But a few are just identifying the best communication channel for each team. So some maybe prefer a phone call, some prefer a visit to their cubicle. I was working with an automotive dealership and very few of the mechanics had access to their employee emails. Since obviously they're working under the hood of vehicles all day or in the shop or on the floor, it was better for them to receive the communication that needs an immediate response by simply just having a face-to-face conversation. If it takes more than three emails to explain something, pick up the phone or walk down the hall, have that conversation. And that's probably one of the biggest ones that seems like common sense, but is not so common. And I'm sure that maybe you can think of one or two people uh, for the listeners out there. If you have a team member that just would prefer to hide behind email, right? Do you have any one you can think of that? Just pick up the phone and have the conversation. It's going to save us all time. And that's an opportunity to explain the why and create that relationship too. Relationship building is a big one. So just if it takes more than three emails to explain something, pick up the phone and have that conversation. And like I said, it may seem like common sense, but it's not so common. So developing these internal communication best practices is a great way to increase your employee engagement and your internal communication as well. And, and, and that's key. And plus also you got to remember to have a scribe in all meetings, whatever level the meeting, it could be leadership, it could be sales, it could be you know warehouse, but you need to have someone who then communicates what decisions, policies, anything that's come up. So every department does hear about that. I mean, we're guilty of it in our first business that uh, John Roberts salons and spas, you'd start getting clients that would come in asking about the, you know, the new promotion or the, you know, the new, whatever we're running and marketing came up with it, but they failed to tell all the employees at the salons and you feel like an idiot. You're like, well, what 10% off or what pedicure promotion or, you know, and that that's always bad. And it, it, it's never intended, but you're, you just get so siloed in coming up with what you have to come up with. And then you, you push it out there forgetting, you know, you communicate with the outside world, but you may have to communicate with each other. And so that's really important. 
Yeah, I wanted to share an example from one of our clients, Alpenhaus. They are located in New York. They are one of America's largest RV dealers. So with the current state of everything, they've been just very, very busy. And they created an, an internal communication guide that talks about some of the things that you and I just ran through. But one of the big ones that they came up with was just like what you described, John, about the scribe, be specific and assign an owner. So don't you hate when you receive those emails and there's 15 people copied on them, but no one is really sure who needs to take ownership and complete the task. So that was one that, that they identified as an area of opportunity for their internal communication, as well as the subject is not the email and using all caps in those emails. So those were a few of them that, that jumped out to them. So we can all be guilty of treating an email as a text message, especially lately when we're all buried in emails. But in a professional setting, it's something that they wanted to move away from. They had great, really great success in, in changing some of the culture and the internal communication by establishing some of those internal communication best practices that apply to them. So we recommend that you spend some time with your team and, and create those. What makes us successful? What are some internal best practice communication standards that we can develop and all get behind. And then that kind of segues into not all communication is verbal, but some is related to email communication. Yeah, I would actually change that from email, just the digital, because there's so many vehicles now, communication channels. And as you found out, a lot of companies are, are getting away from email communication internally, so I just call it digital communication best practices and some nevers is, is don't communicate in all caps. And I just think our lives, because we're, we're texting so often, uh, we carry those habits and those shortcuts over and we may not realize that it's in all caps or don't treat your digital internal communication with coworkers and definitely clients like you would do a text message where you'd abbreviate and just put the the letter u or you know the letter r as in u r or r u um, don't deliver bad news digitally right if if it can't be a yes to a coworker or to a a client you know pick up the phone you can't hear empathy and compassion in an email. Only carbon copy when absolutely necessary. Don't reply to all. If, if I'm saying, you know, who's available for a meeting next Friday and I'm asking 12 people, well, we don't need 12, you know, you don't have to get 11 other responses of what they're doing, why they aren't, or they are available. Just don't reply to all. And, you know, as you said, the subject is not the email, which are all really, really important. And there's, there's so many more. And it's really important that we treat digital communication internally and externally in the same professional manner, not just with a one word answer, yes, no, can't, uh, whatever that may be. But I know, I, I don't know how long it's been, Jess, maybe a year. Um, I don't know if it was pre-pandemic, but we went total Slack. If you're not familiar with Slack, Slack is great communication channel. And I've been hearing about for, you know, probably five to eight years about how great it is. And it never made sense to me. Like, wh why do you need Slack when you already have emails and you have tax? Like, why do we need another communication channel? And then just so many business owners, clients, the CEOs that I respected said they, they, they went 100% Slack internally and they love it. It was the best decision. I, I, I you know, I said, I just got to do it. And I don't know why, as you know, I, I rolled it out last year sometime, you know, in, in the first quarter of, I think, 2020 and said, no more email communication. Everything has to go via Slack. And no one was happy with that. No one liked change. It didn't make sense at first. But I think it's it's been one of the best things we've done for a community, exactly what you're talking about, a communication. And I'm not here. I don't have stock in Slack. And I'm not saying it has to be Slack. But what I liked about it was it emptied my inbox, right? Because I didn't realize that probably 70, 80, 90% of my inbox emails were internal. So when you remove all those and you get them streamlined in, in proper channels and Slack, now I know my emails are important. My emails are one of two things. They're either from a client or they're spam. 
right? But I mean, it's really nice that, you know, it, it really, instead of going through and then, you know, you have the forward and, and uh, of emails from each employee and you're trying to read through it and it's, it's, it's kind of a cluster. So what has been your evolution with the, the Slack process? I have to admit that I was pretty against Slack to start because like you said, it just felt like another place I had to check and the accountability that came along with checking another platform. And, you know, we have Salesforce and we have Slack and we have email and we have text message and phone calls. And so it just felt like another place. And so I was pretty apprehensive to jump on the Slack bandwagon, but it has to start with leadership. I would literally text John or Dave and they would message me back and say, I'm not answering you until you put this in Slack. So it was like forced me in that direction. So I think that that it has to start with leadership and it it doesn't have to be Slack. Like you said, but uh, teams is another one that I've seen my clients use. Like you said, John, you know that now if you receive an email, it's either about a client, a client is copied or it's directly from them, or it's a spam message, perhaps. So right. it has cleared up the inbox, and we have different channels in Slack for different topics. So, for instance, you know, we would internally send each other articles that we've read, or documentaries that we've watched, or articles that we're, we we're tagged in. Now we just have a Slack channel that says articles, and so all of the articles are put in that Slack channel. So it's almost like an archive channel where you can visit that to find all of the articles rather than someone sending an, e- an article via email. 10 of us are copied, nine of us comment on the article, you know, so it just, it, it clouds your email. And now we know when we receive an email, it's, it needs to be answered. Like now it, it's important. Um, not that Slack messages aren't, but if it's in the article channel on Slack, I know I can get to it on the plane or on a commute or at a break. It's not something I have to jump on right away. So that's my plug for that. But email communication best practices, try to determine what's going to be, what, what is an email for? What are the best practices around that? And what how do we internally communicate with each other and what are the best practices around that because they they can be separate they can be different yeah so that leads into i I love when when i've asked and i don't know if you've done this just when i'm speaking to one company and i have all their employees or a lot of representation and you know you got i'll go through the list i'll say who here works in support and you know they'll raise their hand who works in sales who works in HR, who works, and then the last one is it was really a setup for this. I say, and, and who works in customer service? And you know, a couple of people raise their hand. Maybe they work the phones or, or whatever. And then eventually, there's a ripple effect where everyone raises their hand, and that's a that's a really important aha because, as you pointed out earlier, we all have customers, and it's the job of leaders to make sure everyone realizes who their customer is. And so we like to call them invisible service providers. And invisible service providers are people who don't traditionally, in your organization, traditionally deal with the outside customer, client, patient, but they're a big part of you know your customer experience, client experience. And that could be someone in shipping, that could be someone in marketing, that could be someone in HR, that could be someone in payroll and accounts receivable. All the ones, your customer is whoever benefits from the work you do or conversely, who suffers from the work you do. And that could be the person in the cube next to you, down the hall, or, or you might be in a home office and they might be calling from a location. And sometimes we don't treat them. We treat them as an interruption versus the reason why we have a job and and headquarters has a job and their customers is is operation. So, you know, if you're not serving the customer, you better be serving someone that is. And as we said, your customers, whoever is dependent on the work you do. And and I always love to tell this, this story. When I was in college, 
I got a great job at UPS and it, it was a great job because it paid well, it was benefits, but the drawback to the job, I was a preloader and a preloader worked from like 3.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. every morning, five hours. And then I'd go to college, I'd go to school right from there. And obviously working in the middle of nights wasn't my favorite, but the job was great and it paid you know, extremely well for anything I could get. It was more than double. But my job as a preloader was to load the package cars that the drivers would then come in at 8.30 and take out and deliver to houses, uh, the packages of houses and businesses. So if you had asked me back then, you know, who my customer was, I'd laugh and say, I don't have a customer or maybe the box. The box is my customer. If I don't, if I don't step on it or I don't crush whatever's inside of it, you know, that would have been my answer. So, you know, I, I try to do a good job every day and I load the truck and, and at the end, right before you, you know, you, you'd close the back door, you'd have to stuff that the big boxes in the center and, and that truck would be filled to the brim. Now, every package had a, a an address and, and every address had a section of the truck it went on and it was designed logistically for where that driver was going to be where he'd start off where he'd you know head towards it at 8 30 and then you know noon and then two o'clock it, it was all loaded in sequential order so you know you had to know where each section well at the end of you know the, after i loaded that truck and packed it to the brim and put all the bulkhead in then you couldn't even barely you know put a toothpick in after that we'd get these stragglers what I'd call stragglers. It might be an envelope or something that would come down the, the conveyor belt. And it would be for a package that, you know, for a section of a truck that was in the front. And, you know, I had one or two options. I, I could take all these boxes out and then walk up and slide it to the section, or I could just try to Frisbee it in and think that I'd have better luck. And I always chose the Frisbee because I, I was exhausted. It was, it was five hours of hard labor and I had to get to school and I wasn't going to spend another five, 10 minutes of, of unpacking what I've already packed. So I'd Frisbee it in. And then, you know, whenever that happened the next day, that driver would come in and he'd be furious with me and he'd yell at me and tell me how I ruined his day because, you know, he found that package later and I, I didn't get it. And I was kind of like, you know, to me, these drivers were making so much money, right? And to me, they, they were making, you know, they, they got the, the top rate for drivers was really good money back then. It, it may still be. So, I, you know, I had no empathy. And then I graduated from college and I went driving and I'm, you know, now I have my own load and I'm, I'm, I'm delivering and I'm hustling and I'm, I have a newborn baby at home and I, I'm skipping breaks and lunches. And I just want to get home as early as possible. And I remember there's one time it was like four o'clock and I had three stops left and I get to the payphone. This is how long ago this is. I get to the payphone. I call my wife and tell her that, you know, I'm going to be home by five o'clock, make dinner, make reservations. We're going to have a great night. And then I go to one of the last packages and I find it, it was misloaded and it was for an area of town that I was in this morning. And now I have to drive across town in rush hour to deliver this one package that meant I probably won't get home until after 6, 630. But it wasn't until that moment I realized how important the preloader was to a day in the life of a driver. And had UPS taught me that and made me realize that I think I would have been a much better preloader. So what is your day in life? Who's the day in the life of the invisible service providers? And, and they need to know how important they are. I didn't realize how important I was, you know, to the, the customer. It also, it was inconvenience. The customer was used to getting their packages delivered before 10. Now it wasn't getting it till five or 6 PM. And they might've promised a customer, oh, be here by 10, we'll have it for you. We always get our UPS orders by 10 there's just a ripple effect. So, you know, what are the, the, the positive and negative impacts? And are you making sure the invisible service providers get their recognition of the important part they play in the client experience and that they understand who their direct customer is? Yeah, it's important to look at both of those aspects when you're talking about invisible service providers and the awareness around that. And that, that does create a great internal culture when you're able to establish those things. People are more empathetic and compassionate for their team members. One of the most important pieces I feel of internal culture is, is the fun part. It's team building. So do you have team building that you currently utilize or employee engagement opportunities to get people together 
when it's not necessarily all work related. So there's a few best practice examples that I want to share with you relating to in office and then out of office ideas that can be utilized. So it's something as simple as shadowing other departments or positions or perhaps developing a buddy system with other locations or teams. So you have that internal team member that you can go to in that department when you have a question or a comment or a concern perhaps. But mentoring, a mentoring program is another thing that some of my clients have implemented recently uh, for those that wanna grow with the organization or an emerging leader career growth plan. That's another one that, that some of my clients are doing. Now, at this point, you may have rolled out some of the DeJulius Group methodology pieces, whether it's the customer service action statement that John referenced earlier, maybe it's your nevers and always statements, but creating a competition between departments for certification of any new content being rolled out is a great team building activity, uh, but it's also a good way to certify your team members that they know and understand new content that you rolled out. So those are a few in-office team building activities that we recommend that you consider implementing. But there are some other out of office ideas uh, that can be happy hour events or family picnics, or maybe an escape room activity or something off campus, like a top golf event or something like that. Now there is some price associated with some of those things. And, and I'm, I'm conscious of that. But one that I really like to do is an experiential tour. And an experiential tour is a good activity to send your teams out to great service providers. So visit a Nordstrom with your team, visit a Chick-fil-A for lunch, those other world-class brands, and compare those to those that maybe have some room to grow. And then have a discussion with, with your team after, after lunch or after that experiential tour where they look at the experiences they, that, that they received at that world-class provider have a discussion on what sets them apart from each other. That's a great one because there's some things in there that, that create good conversation and maybe it's outside of your industry, but it's something that you can implement with your team. So it's a good learning activity too. And then another one, um, maybe offering volunteer hours or being involved with charity events. So those are other ideas for some out of office, but Advanced Financial is really great at doing this. So Advanced Financial is located in Nashville, Tennessee. They have over a hundred stores and they do um, lines of credit loans, check cashing, money orders, those types of things. But they really uh, value team building and internal culture. And I've also implemented ev almost every piece of our of the DeJulius Group methodology. One of the great things that they do is they have 5K race sponsorships and team sports sponsorships so that uh, people can connect with each other outside of the office and really get to know each other and have those, those types of events. And that all comes back internally, right? If, if we know our team members better, we're more willing to advocate and better serve them. So before the pandemic, and, and these are some, some examples that I shared are depending on where you're located, maybe some things that you can implement now, maybe they have to wait for some restrictions to be lifted, but it's a good idea to start brainstorming now so that we're prepared and ready to go when, when the world is. But before the pandemic, I was promoted to a CFO at the DeJulius Group. And no, that's not chief financial officer, but it's chief fun officer. So who's in charge of planning your team events if it if it's not if someone's not accountable for doing it, it usually doesn't get done. So, designate someone on your team to be the CFO, and think of that show, The Office. So, who is part of your party planning committee? And it sounds so silly, but this is a fun thing for people to get and become a part of, and develop those team building pieces that, you know, we weren't able to do for so long now, and people are really craving these things. So just remember that your customers will never be happier than your employees are. And that's why it's important to build relationships with our team members. And that can look so many different ways. And you're probably pretty good at, at relationship building, or maybe, maybe you think you are, but John's book really covers relationship building and it's called The Relationship Economy. So all about building relationships in the digital age. And there's some great, great best practice 
examples in there uh, relating to collecting board information and celebrating team members and handwritten thank you notes are another good way to do that. So I may be shared some examples that have some cost associated with it, but there are many that you can, can do and implement that don't necessarily have a cost associated with it, but still allow for your team members to feel valued and uh, to feel like they're part of something bigger at your team and, and providing that internal culture. You know, I love about the four trivia is when our clients and when we do it on each other, and, and it's a great way, you know, team building, as you say, who, who's the one that played college soccer? Who's the one that, you know, is a deadhead? And it gets us to know each other better on things you'd never know and also practice for it and, and realize the impact it could have. So those are great. And, and you could do that virtually obviously in person. Yeah. And so I, I just, I can't recommend it enough to get with your team and, and develop a plan because people are craving that connection again. And just like John said at the beginning of this episode, when I went to the conference and spoke this week, it was, everyone is just, is just craving that connection again, to meet with people and to be a part of things. So that, it's just a good opportunity to continue to build that internal culture. Yes, on the la last part, I, I want to make sure, because this is important, is the internal handoffs from one department to another. And it's so important because uh, this is really how it affects the customer and, and, the, and the customer experiences it. Talk to us about what an internal handoff is, where are they, and how easy is it uh, if you don't you know, give it its attention, things slip through the cracks. Yeah. So when you think about an internal handoff, you probably have a few of these that ultimately do affect the, the external customer or the client. But uh, the internal handoffs are areas where there's a, a transfer in between departments or team members. And we've talked about it before. There's, there's cold transfers and there's warm transfers, right? A, a cold transfer is you know, forwarding an email blindly to one of your team members that they've never heard of this client before and you're telling them to address the situation and you're on the receiving end of that email and you're just thinking, what the heck is going on? No one told me about this. What does this mean? Who is this person, right? So that would be an example of a cold transfer, but a warm transfer is really making sure your team members, your other departments are educated and have some background information before you just hit forward or hit send and, and expect them to, to do it or to respond. So what does that warm transfer look like? Or how do we make sure that that transfer is warm in between departments or team members? So you would want to identify what those areas are. And the biggest one that we see is the typical sales to service handoff. It's like the left hand doesn't know what, what the right hand is doing. And that's so frustrating for both ends of the spectrum. So if you think about a typical sales to service handoff, what we'd want to do in this is identify what goes wrong in that handoff, whether it's not having enough information, not having the right information, but looking at what goes wrong and then looking at that internal handoff and seeing how do we make it better? How do we improve upon that handoff? That could be something as simple as just making sure that the information is consistent and it's updated in the system or making sure that you're sending that information to your team member in advance, right? Give them time to look it over. Sales, give them time to look, look the service team to look it over before you just expect them to jump on a client call the next day and know everything or the next hour, I should say, and know everything. So give them time. And make sure that that transfer is warm and manage expectations. John, you say it all the time, like many issues stem from mismanaging expectations in some degree. And it's so true from that handoff, usually between sales and service. So that's just a really big hot button for that uh, handoff is that managing expectations piece. And what does that look like? And then taking it a step further and identifying 
how do we improve? What's the above and beyond opportunity to do? So maybe it's taking it a step further and the sales team lines up a service provider that is from the same region or has the same background or interest utilizing that forward information that they captured, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, it's not that that's always going to be something that we can do, but that would be an improvement opportunity to expand upon. So we recommend that you take a look at all of your internal handoffs and assess that. Where do you drop the ball? What goes wrong there? What should we be doing? You know, what can we do to make it even better? And that's the process that we recommend following there. It's so important, this handoff, and you'll trace the majority of client dissatisfaction and employee dissatisfaction is trace to the onboarding and that's like right so sales you know closes it now they're handing it over to the accountant lawyer uh, consultant uh, account executive whoever that is so there needs to be an onboarding process that doesn't just get handed off but they're both involved but even go to the when we hire a, a new employee all right. That's usually an HR person. That's usually someone that's recruiting and doing the interview process and tells them about the job. Now they get hired and now they deal with someone else. They, they have to go into, you know, and, and meet with their direct supervisor and they're supposed to have orientation. They're supposed to have the training. That onboarding is such a delicate process because just like if you're a client, you, you, the salesperson built the relationship, sold you on why you'd want to do business with us, but then you get thrown into someone else who you know may not have all the information or you know the client could feel like it, they were overpromised. Same thing with a, a new employee, right? The HR person they built a relationship with, and, and that's the reason why they want the job and how great it's going to be. Well, all of a sudden, you know, their first day of work, it's not with that HR person. It could be with their, their supervisor. And it, you have to, it has to be a delicate handoff, a delicate onboarding. And it takes both teams to be part of that. It just can't be a cold transfer, as you said. Yeah. And there's another client that I worked with, they're a consulting firm as well. And what they chose to do as a result of this workshop is they were looking at, okay, where are, where are the internal handoffs that exist? And they look to improve upon those. But then they took it a step further and said, how can we elevate the level of client experience that we offer? And it led us down a, a, a path to identify that, hey, we need a project closeout meeting and it needs to be intentional and it needs to be within five business days so that it's fresh in our memory and it needs to include this team and that team and this team and that team to make sure that we're all on the same page because they realized that it was one a learning opportunity for areas of improvement it was an opportunity to give praise and recognition and reward those teams that did well on this project it was just an overall opportunity to have a positive and defined closeout experience with a focus on improving the client experience. And that's what we're all about. So that was just a, a really great takeaway that we've actually decided to implement at the DeJulius Group as well. After a partnership you know, comes to an end, we look at that, we, we get our team together, we get their team together, and we look at, hey, here's what we did really well. Now we looked at industry, uh, it, like if that particular thing that we implemented, applies to other industries, is it specific to that industry? So it was a learning opportunity for everyone involved. And then there was another piece that they also implemented, the signed agreement to the project handoff stage, which is pretty similar to that sales to service handoff that I was referencing. And then John referenced it as onboarding, that client onboarding. So they implemented an internal client kickoff stage. So adding that internal client kickoff stage and then also adding the uh, project closeout stage was just a great opportunity to continue internally educating each other and making sure that they were providing the best service possible. And then it ultimately affects and influences the external customer. And so that's one thing I, I do recommend as well is look at your internal handoffs that exi exist and then push yourself a little bit further and determine which ones do we need to add. And which ones do we need to clearly define? Because the the opportunity there to improve your organization internally as well as externally is just incredible. This has been awesome, Jess. I mean, so much information. It's so important. Hopefully we've stressed that 
a great client experience, a great customer experience is powered by a great employee experience. And the employee experience is not just top down. You could, you know, the employee can love working for their boss, their supervisor, their leader, but if they don't like who they work with, and we all know that we spend more time with our, our coworkers, our team members than we do our family. And you got to make sure that, you know, if you're a leader, you are managing that culture and you got to make sure that you manage that culture that, you know, the, the teams play well together. They play well with each other's, uh, the other departments and they understand the, the importance they play in making it work and ultimately for the customer. But nothing will have a bigger impact on your success than having a world-class internal culture. So Jess, you, you, this is something that you, you are very passionate about. Our clients love these workshops that you do with them. So thank you for sharing so much of uh, your brilliance with us today. Yeah, thanks for the time. And I, I just love this workshop. It's it's one of my favorites and it's so exciting to do right now because clients just have a big opportunity here. So world-class internal culture is creating that internal world-class experience between team members and departments. And that is world-class internal culture in a nutshell with those takeaways. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, revolutionaries, for joining us for another episode, episode 45 of the Customer Service Revolution. Thank you, Jess, and we will see all of you next week. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for listening to and being part of the Customer Service Revolution. To hear more episodes, subscribe now on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We love feedback and look forward to your reviews, likes, and emails. Join John live at this year's Customer Service Revolution. Tickets available at CustomerServiceRevolution.com. 